to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a personal introduction first because Professor Benita and I have been friends for 28 years. 28 years. 28 years. We went to uh, UCLA together and we worked with our dear teacher, Professor Benjamin Elman, who is also here today in the audience. And uh, so this is a real reunion. And I also think that Shanee's daughter is here in the audience who she's currently now at Barnard College. And so really is kind of a family reunion, but it's, it's also much more. It's also a professional setting where we have a fabulous scholar uh, sharing some of his insights into uh, Qing history. Uh, Professor Benit is a PhD from UCLA, and he's been teaching at NYU for also, I don't know, 20, 25 years? 20 years. Yeah. 20 years. Uh, in, in, and he wears many, many hats. He's in the history department. He is also related to the East Asian studies field, of course, uh, but he also has done work in Middle Eastern studies, Jewish history. Uh, it just, and, you know, this reflects He's a polymath uh, and a polyglot um, who uh, knows a whole range of uh, languages and those linguistic skills he's put um, to use from the beginning since I've known him, right? So he's worked his most, his first book, as uh, many of you know, uh, looks at Hui Muslims in um, the Qing and their strategies for survival, especially as they navigated the intellectual and institutional plane of the civil service examination. But since then he's gone on to, to write so much more uh, although China pulls you back yeah. in. Uh, yeah. So he's also done world history. I should also add that he's done world history. Um, but to just give you a sense of some of the stuff uh, that he's recently done, and which also points to kind of the diversity of his interests, his two most recent writings include an article titled To Turn the Historical Clock Back, Time, Text, and the Politics of Yuan Shikai's Monarchy. So despite being a Qing historian, he uh, freely moves into the 20th century. Uh, and then he also has a second article coming out entitled Exile, Empire, Jews, and Money, the Ten Tribes Between Asian Geography, Trade, and Capitalism. And that's coming out in the journal, uh, the History, History of Ideas, which is forthcoming. Yeah. Um, so uh, today's talk um, is, I don't know the title of it, Reason, Reason. <laughs> So, so, so we will explain, but it, yeah. it is just really a tremendous, uh, with tremendous happiness and, and pleasure that I uh, invite my dear friends me to, to start his talk. Thank you. Uh, you can hear me now with the microphone, I think in the, for the Zoom. Okay. I, f I am very, very happy to be here, uh, particularly because very dear people are in the audience. Um, and also because that particular room has been in the past 20 years home for me in terms of Chinese history in New York. Um, and I'm grateful that Mehdi is here because Mehdi arranged the first time, the first seminar that I gave her 10 years ago, that this book is coming out of, you know, that seminar. And um, there are some students who uh, took that seminar who would be mentioned and some students that I am, I'm very, very grateful to see them uh, here today as well. Now, um, I'll start right away. Um, yeah, am I good? I think so. Okay, so um, I begin by explaining the title. Uh, so treason by the margins of the book, of course, is a reference to tre to Jonathan Spencer's famous uh, treasons by treason by the book. So I'll explain what I mean by the margins. Okay, by the margins, um, it's of course about marginal populations, not necessarily just Muslims, but others as well, and how they interacted through the margins of the book. But also by margins, I mean, you know, very, very small, even tiny notations that people made of books, on books, you know, that had, I will argue, that's the task for me today, to, uh, I will argue, had great political significance in specific moments in 18th century China. Is that working? Yeah, it's not the slideshow. Oh, I, I, I thought I was in the slideshow. Oh. Sorry, what do you have to do? Oh, there we go. Maybe, oh no. Oh, yeah, 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 good. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we're in the Qing Empire. This is a map from uh, 18, 18, uh, 70, 1820, but most of the time we will be discussing uh, 1780. Um, so let's just uh, imagine that we are um, at that period in, in despite the, the notation on the map. Now, this, what I'm gonna be talking today is a case, and if I have time to, I will visit another case that I already discussed elsewhere, um, a case of censorship um, that is pretty gruesome and pretty bad uh, from Shandong, um, but it's part of the, it makes the penultimate chapter of the book that I'm now finishing, which is a, a, a book about the history of Islam in China from the Tang period, the, more or less the 8th century, 9th century, all the way to the present. Um, and then, you know, I run, as soon as I write something like that, I run into the problem that, you know, the authors of this book are called The Mammoth and the Mouse. In other words, how do you deal with, you know, big temporalities, big territories, large territories where you need to write, you know, about diversify, diverse cases, okay? Um, not only, the, you know, China is diverse and, you know, it has, it is made of many, many histories. You know, the history of Islam in China, you know, particularly different communities represent different stories, different beginnings and different starts. You know, the Muslims who settled in China in the, in the ninth century in Canton, you know, Arab merchants or in Fujian are very, very different than Muslims that arrived from Turkic areas uh, um, in the 16th or 17th or 18th century. You know, my interline migrations of China formed new different new communities and new stories. And at the end of the day, we all lump of them together into one single history and, you know, into one single community. That's always the tendency of the state, of the people who view them, you know, who view minorities, etc. Now, if you want to be pretend to be a sophisticated historian, you end, you end up, you know, actually saying, well, I can't do that. I have to write, you know, all of these histories, you know, and then see how they are connected. Which brings you to a problem, you know, when you, uh, that you end up, you know, writing a series of micro histories, very, very small communities, very small uh, moments, and then you need to connect them and you run into the problem, actually how to connect them without essentializing people. So this is a book that, you know, was written sort of as a defense of microhistory as it was done in the 1990s, um, which suggests actually combining microhistory and morphology. And by morphology, at least the way I understand it, uh, um, morphology is the mammoth, you know. And by morphology, I am, which, I, which is the task that I'm having today, I mean, you know, lineages, I mean, you know, textual lineages, textual connections, you know, political institutions in China, uh, um, the state, the society, you know, water, uh, uh, waterways, you know, um, and, and many, many, many other things that I will point out as I go um, and analyze this tiny text, yes, um, but it allows me to transcend time and transcend geography and actually make connections between different Muslim communities you know, and come up with what I hope will be a one single whole that makes sense, you know, to a reader who is interested to hear an overviewish history of Islam in China, okay? And we are now, we're going to move to the, we're going to move to the, uh, um, we are now in May 16, 1780, um, in an area uh, which is called, in Shandong, which is called Shoguan County, um, where everything is going to happen in that day. And I went into this case by pure chance because uh, one of my colleagues, Joanna Wally Cohen, left uh, um, a, a very basic chronology of the Qing dynasty and I was running, looking into it. And then, you know, I read into, went into this uh, uh, case. So the story is that a man named Wei Xu in Shouguan, you know, who's a minor literatus, but of a prestigious uh, family, was arrested on May 16, 1780. It's described in the report that went all the way to the Qianlong Emperor as a sort of a, as, a, as an egg hint, as a shusheng. You know, he's like a, reads books, he's really into books and so on. The way family features in the stories and in either uh, documents as if involved in education. Um, I have discovered um, in, the, um, in the Library of Congress that, you know, one of his, I think his grandfather, Wei Minglong, was an examiner in the Shandong province uh, um, 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 at some point. And as we go, you know, the story that the magistrate is telling, you know, they went into uh, his house and they searched it because he was involved in a case of forgeries and theft. 
Okay, so two families in Shogwang, you know, were uh, accusing each other of theft. There were two brothers-in-law, you know, one of them was saying, was saying, you're stealing things from me. You know, there was involved issues involved with their wives, you know, a big mess, like something that, you know, you read in the tabloid. When she wrote a petition to one of the, uh, to the magistrate, you know, in which, you know, he sided with one on behalf of one of the uh, uh, people who were struggling, you know, and ended up being, his house being searched. In his house, they found a book, okay? And that book led to him being accused in high treason, yes? And not only that, he was executed and his family was ordered to change their names. Okay, that's important for, uh, uh, for the future. There was a whole scene, you know, where they were begging not to be, not to be executed, etc. you know, and so on. We also know that the emperor, um, who suspiciously reacts very, very quickly to this case, the emperor changed his mind at some point. Initially, he was lenient. Okay. Remember, you know, when you petition to accuse someone in high treason, you know, the emperor has to approve it and he has to approve the punishment. In this case, you know, the emperor actually makes a notation and says, move it from leniency to death, to beheading. Okay. And that's interesting. And I will hope to uh, come to it in a minute. Okay. So um, this is the way family, you know, I mean, uh, we can now read, read uh, gazetteers very, very quickly. Um, and uh, um, we enter into the, the story um, more seriously. The main person who is in charge of all of this is the Aishin Zhu Guotai, you know, a Manchu governor of Shandong uh, from the White Banner. He's actually part of the royal family uh, uh, of sorts. Um, a very, very corrupted man. Okay, and uh, I'm not uh, dissing on him. I mean, he was executed uh, or ordered to commit suicide in 1782. Uh, by uh, uh, by the, the Chenlong Emperor, but at this time he's still very, very important uh, uh, governor of, of Shandong. And he accuses Wei Shu of insulting Muslims by writing few characters on the margins of a book that was found in his house. So we started with some gossip stories and then the men is searched and then they find this book. Okay, so what's the case? The case is the absurd commentary that he made on a book that, was re that is entitled, you know, on relocating the Western tribes by a man named Jiang Tong. Okay, let's go to this Jiang Tong. So Jiang Tong, um, this is, uh, of course, I'm, I'm sure it didn't look like this, but someone imagining him looking like this at some point, and this is, um, um, let's go with that uh, 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 painting. Okay, Jiang Tong uh, was an official who uh, worked, uh, who served the, the, the Jin Dynasty in 310, uh, 310 uh, um, CE, and he was uh, he served in northwestern China. That's a critical uh, uh, place for us. He served in northwestern China, and then he wrote a book called "On Relocating the Western Tribes." Okay, he was he wrote the book in 299. He started as a memo to the emperor. And, and he basically, it's a very, very interesting text because the main premise of the book is that the barbarians ruin China. Okay, nothing new in there, okay? Although in his time, it was quite new because what he offered is a history, quote unquote, of how barbarians, you know, ruin China. And he says, from the beginning, you know, since the Shang Dynasty, okay? In other words, you know, even before China was China, you know, you have these moments where the barbarians, you know, from the Northwest, that takes moments of weakness of, of China, when China is kind of uh, uh, a weak, and they move in, they settle in, they take on many, all sorts of territories, and basically they co cause all sorts of problems, okay? In an earlier version, I said that this is like Trump number one. It's like Trump on uh, steroids. He offers basically to block them, and then he says, we must remove them, okay? Um, and it goes all the way back, you know, to ancient, uh, almost, almost basically mythical times, okay? And, you know, he recommended in his memo that specific groups that in ancient China were known as the Wuhu, the five tribes or the five Central Asian eth ethnicities, the Xiongnu, the Xianbe, the Jie, the Di, and the Qiang, moved from everywhere they settled in China. Now, if you know anything about China in that period, 
you know, this is we are well into the period in the post Han period where actually you have even more migration into certain territories, taking advantage of the fact that China is weak and kind of divided. We just come out of the uh, uh, three uh, kingdoms period, you know, and he's very, very worried. Of course, he knows why he's worried. He's in this in this areas in the northwest. So he wrote an, a memo to the emperor says on relocating the the uh, uh, the barbarian tribes, and of course. As emperors in China always do, particularly when there's an upright and a very, very worried official that writes them a memo, they never listen. So, you know, the emperor did nothing, okay? Um, the Huidi emperor of the Jing ignored Jiang Tong, you know, he was a, he was a wimp, okay? Um, and in fact, the term, the term Xi Rong, relocating, relocating the, 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 those Western tribes, you know, occurs only twice in Chinese letters. Today, thanks to um, various things that people, sophisticated people call digital humanities, we can actually ascertain that. Okay. So the term relocating the Western tribes occurs twice. And, and both of them, you know, have to do are connected to Tian. Okay. One is in the Ming Dynasty, in the Ming period. If I have time, I'll go into it. And maybe no, it doesn't matter. But basically, it's a very, very rare proposal. Okay. Um, Hui ignored Jiang Tung, but it turns out that the text was somewhat prophetic. Why? Because in 304, the Wu Hu, the five tribes, did rebel and they started a war that lasted for 12 years. And the 12 years basically and it not only destroyed the Jin dynasty of the period, destroyed China, quote unquote, depending how you look at it. And you know, it ended up in creating no less than 16 kingdoms that ruled most of China for over a century. Okay. And this was a period of constant wars known in Chinese history as the 16 kingdoms or the five non Han uh, uh, people kingdoms. Okay. We're talking about over a century of uh, disruptions and so on. And here's a list of all of the kingdoms that were there. And you can just imagine the upheaval and the terror and, you know, the strife and all the constant wars and movements in China in this period. Okay. So Jiang Tong goes down in history as a prophet. He said only five years before, let's get rid of all of these people. And now they rule China. Of course, this is a very, very skewed approach, you know. I mean, there were many other reasons, and we can't really blame the barbarians, quote unquote, on what was going on, but that's how it is. This book that he wrote was included in the official history of the Jin, the Jin Shu, and it was largely forgotten. Okay. Um, but if we move to the 20th, if we move to the 18th century, you can see why such a book would be problematic in the Manchu Qin period, because the Manchus themselves are, you know, so-called barbarian foreigners, et cetera, et cetera, who invaded China, et cetera, et cetera. But it's an official book that is included in an official history that is part of the 24, the 24 dynastic histories, you know, which by the way, the Qianlong Emperor is actually collecting at the time and creating a collection called 24 Direction History. So in other words, only in this book, does this mean that, you know, it means death, such like a horrible thing, and you know, having everybody around. Okay, so you have that book. Just imagine that, you know, you live in the, the 50s in the United States and you have an ancient copy of the Communist Manifesto. Okay, not a great thing, but not necessarily, you know, means, you know, every, every, bad things. But why, now, before I move into what he wrote there, let me ask, why was he interested in the book? Okay. And we have a very, very important clue in the report, okay? The officials here, I would like to zoom in on also how they play the emperor, because that's one of my points. They mentioned in their remarks that, the, that they, saw, they see some bound books there, you know, and that they, these books were handed over by Wei's ancestor, okay? All right. So, and I think, you know, um, there's a person here who wrote about classicism and kinship and talking about how, you know, certain books move in, in, in lineages, you know. So that explains why this man had this book, you know. And he's, some of his ancestors own these books, okay. Now, the ancestor in question and this evil, you know, trickster uh, governor doesn't mention the ancestor. He wants the emperor to know on his own who is this ancestor. Like, didn't mention his name. Okay, but the ancestor is uh, uh, his great great grandfather, someone by the name of Wei Yu, okay, who lived in the late Ming period and 
but very importantly, during the period of the Manchu invasion to China. Okay. Now, Wang Yu uh, was a Jinshi of uh, 1637. He served as an imperial censor during the Ming. Okay. But he was one of the first Ming officials that turned to move the Manchu Qing right after the invasion. In other words, these people invaded China and part of the administration moved to start to working with them. Okay. Now, in 1645, that's like a year after the invasion, uh, Wu Yu, you know, was appointed to a post in northwestern province of Gansu. It's the same territory where Jiang, Tsung, Jiang Tong was. It's the same territory that everybody is imagining. I'm not going to go there, but everybody imagines it. Okay, he was there, where he gained some recognition for advising the new regime of the Manchus with, you know, how to conciliate, you know, basically to control the Muslims in the remote. Western territories for trade and other means that new rulers, you know, that the new rulers could avoid the mistakes of the previous Ming dynasty on the frontier. Now, when I discuss the Ming period in this book, I talk a lot about, you know, this whole idea of conciliate and control that the Ming, the Ming dynasty did after it cre recreated the borders of China and invented what we call today China proper by basically excluding, you know, a lot of Muslim peoples. Okay, who during the earlier period, the Mongol period, even before that, basically were moving in and out of these territories freely. Now they suddenly become people who are beyond the border. Now, the Ming, particularly at the beginning, after they stabilized the borders, were quite savvy in how to handle these people. Towards the end, they're not very, very good, but there were officials like this way, you know, the way of the uh, um, who were serving the two dynasties, who had the knowledge of how to deal with all of these people. And they were by now, you know, they have adopted uh, um, Islam, etc. Okay. So he serves there, he did very, very good, you know, and then, you know, you have the usual upheavals, he runs into problems with other people, etc., etc. And the end of the day, he, everybody is happy with him and he's allowed to return to his home in Shandong, you know, and, you know, live on a pension and everything is, is fine. Most probably, he basically moved to the same home where the books, the banned books, you know, a hundred years, something years later were found. That explains us a lot of things, okay? This little detail. What, is, what does it explain? It explains, first of all, why Wei Xu, the person who is the poor hero of our uh, talk today, why he possessed these books, why he thought, you know, he could, why he was reading them, why he was interested in them, Okay, and why also he thought that he had some knowledge about the Northwest. Okay, but before I move, let's move back into why he's now in so much trouble. To be a descendant of a Ming official that moved to work the Qing, the work with the Qing officials, it's a good thing, right? Isn't it? I mean, they are the dynasty that is now in power. Okay, well, yes and no. In the, Qing, in the early Qing period, particularly during the Kangxi period, in other words, in the late 17th century, these people, all sorts of officials who moved from serving the Ming to serving the Qing, were valorized. They did a great service for the new empire, the great service to the new dynasty. Okay? They should be thankful. Okay? This is important, of course, because the Qing were still struggling you know, to stabilize their, legitimacy, their power and uh, their legitimacy there. So whoever, whatever officials who move to work with them, you know, increase their legitimacy. However, during the Qing, the Qing Chenlong period, in other words, when we are in the year 1780, where they, are very, they feel very confident, you know, very legitimate dynasty, they don't want to encourage the kind of behavior even if it saved them 120 years before, okay? So whereas Qianlong Emperor's grandfather valorized these people, the Qianlong, and this is, of course, I'm dealing, quoting, you know, Pema Crossley's book, you know, uh, on this whole episode. The Qianlong Emperor recommissions a new set of biographies of officials who served the two dynasties, and now there's a new game, okay? And Qianlong actually introduces a distinction. And he says, if you were a Ming official and you were based north of the Great Wall, in other words, outside China proper or outside the, what China considers its boundaries, and you move to work with us, you're good. However, if you live south of the Great Wall, inside China proper, 
and you want to move, you want to work, you move to work with us, you are actually faithless, and you are a traitor because you betrayed the Ming. Okay, you are supposed to continue to be loyal to the Ming. Of course, this is a, a an emperor who wants to increase the, the sense of loyalty to his own private, uh, to his own moment in the in the in the high chain. Okay, so he's not going to condone any act of treason, even if you know it was done um, towards his dynasty. So now they actually create a new set of biographies, the Urchin Juan. In other words, a collection of biographies of ministers who served both dynasties. And now, of course, if you are in Shandong, you are south of the Great Wall, it means that now you enter into a very, very gray zone where you can be condemned for a traitor. So now we can understand why, you know, uh, Wei Shu is so much trouble in 1780. Actually, treason flows in his lineage, you know. I mean, he's a descendant of someone who actually moved from the Ming, Ming to the Qing. Now, here's where, you know, Guo Tai is such a trickster. Okay, he knows. He knows exactly what this would mean to uh, to uh, the Chenlong Emperor because you know these were not uh, the one. These were like a very well known list of officials who did that. But he doesn't mention his, his, his report. Doesn't say, "Oh, where you worked in the Northwest, all of that business." He just says his ancestor gave him the book as if like he's an innocent bystander, and he wants the emperor to reach this conclusion alone. You know that in fact the, the, one of the ancestors is in fact a member of this uh, group, you know, those who uh, served the two, the two, um, the two uh, 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 dynasties. And all of this transition in the way in which these people are understood and remembered, you know, is happening only four years before because the Chenlong Emperor commissioned making the, creating the, the, the new collection of the biographies, thereby condemning these people as traitors or, you know, somewhat traitors, you know, in 1776. Okay, so now we can understand why he's in so much trouble. He has a basically a problematic book that is an anti-barbarian in his possession. One of his ancestors is a traitor or sort of a traitor. Okay, and now we can actually find, go to the margins and see what he was writing there. And he wrote very few notes. In fact, few uh, characters. That's all he wrote there. And Guotai, you know, he quotes him verbatim. In other words, when you look at the file, you see the case verbatim there in the quotes. So we can we can read what he wrote on the uh, on the margins. And he says, okay, first of all, um, we should praises uh, praises um, um, he praises Jiang Tong. You know, the author from the uh, from the two ninety nine. He said he was the only hero among many, many unworthy official of his time. Okay. He was the only one who saw the danger and sounded the alarm. Okay. And now he writes the most incriminating line. Okay. All of that is okay, and I'm going to deal with it in a second, in the first part. Okay. What does it mean um, in, this, in, the, in the context of 1780 China? But let's go to the second part of what he writes. And then he says, during the gym, the only danger was the five tribes, and that's it. But in our times, in other words, in 1780, it is the Muslims who have become the same danger. And note here that he doesn't really say Muslims. He says followers of the Islamic teaching. And the, the governors are going to go into it in a minute. Okay? So now we have the basis for the accusation. Okay? He basically says, now this is the, the this is Guotai speaking, interpreting those lines. He says, because you saw that the Emperor Hudi of Jin, you know, accommodated the five tribes and was not listening to Jiang Tong's advice, and because he saw that later you know, he was chaos by the five tribes, as I described before, you know, he came to think that this situation is like that of today. Okay. In other words, he's accused of making these comparisons. He's accused of making a set of analogies and comparison from the period of the third century, fourth century to this time. Okay. And then he says, you know, it's like basically today, you know, every, the followers of Islam in the realm. In other words, he's imagining the Muslims all over China. In other words, there's a situation that this man is accused for sitting in one place and imagine that the migrants, you know, that the foreigners, that the barbarians are all over the place. Now, if you know anything about, you know, xenophobia, you know that that's the case. You imagine them everywhere. Okay. Um, 
in, in, in you have we have polls that were done in in in, uh, in Germany in the early in the early part of the of the third rise and you know Germans were saying that the numbers of Jews are much greater than they really were they thought that they were everywhere okay that's very very common okay so and also they co he continues to say he also makes this connection between you know the territory that we know as the Wubu in other words the territory that was the original territory in the northwest where the five tribe barbarian tribes were coming for you know it says basically it's what we call today the Hubu in other words the territory where the Muslims were now living and this is a territory that both the Ming was trying very hard to control and also at that period the Qing as well in fact the Qing just finished the conquest of the territory that we know today as Xinjiang, basically dealing with all these uh, uh, territories that we now uh, uh, um, that that we're going. And you know, there's plenty of knowledge streaming out of the people there, the ethnicities, and the people that they were doing there. That. And then you know, the the righteous uh, 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 governor is completely outraged by all of this, uh, you know, hatreds of of, of uh, hatreds of Muslims and Islamophobia. He says, how can he how can he say that about Muslims? You know, the Muslims. You know, I mean, it's absurd to equate today's Muslims with the five tribes of the Jin times. You know, in fact, you know, there's a certain element in that. You know, I mean, these some of these ethnicities did convert to Islam. You know, it's not we cannot really establish any direct lineages. But these areas of the third century are now heavily Muslim, okay, and in many ways are defined by Islam, okay. And all, mostly it says also to those Muslims everywhere are law abiding people, and without doubt they con con conduct their affairs peacefully and honestly, okay. And over here, I made a point about that he doesn't say followers of Islam, okay, he doesn't really talk about you know the, the faith itself, he talks about them as Hui Min, you know, Hui people. Okay, he's using a different term. In fact, I checked. Um, it's in many ways, you know, uh, uh, Ray Shu is the only person who's actually using the only the faith in order to define these people. So he's his beef with Muslims is even bigger. You know, he's like making a point about the fact that they convert to Islam, that they become followers. It's not about just ethnicity. And the reason why I think he does that is because he wants to establish the case that the five tribes that. Janton used to hate in the fourth century have now converted and become Muslims, you know, so it's about the religion. Okay. Okay. Clearly about the ethnicity, but also about the religion. Okay. And for them, you know, I mean, they don't care about all of this delocation. They see Hui people all over the place and they're okay. You know, they are just Hui people. Okay. And they make a point say, like, how can you say that the territory of the five tribes are the territories of the Muslims? Let's summarize all the crimes for now, okay? So he owns a problematic book, but that's not, that doesn't kill you, okay? The emperor himself printed that book. He praised Chang, uh, Jiang Tong as the only man in the empire that understood the foreign, foreign danger. That means that he, he thinks he's Jiang Tong, okay? He thinks that he's Jiang Tong. But if he thinks that he's Jiang Tong, what does it make of the emperor of China? If the emperor of the Jing period was a wimp, and ignored the danger and had lost the Jin. What does it say about Chen Long? You know, our dear, dear emperor, you know, had all of these nice universalist ideologies who were like, just brought the fragrant concubine from Xinjiang, you know, just built a mosque, just did all of these things. What does it say about him? Is he a wimp? Okay. That's sort of a dagger right into Qing ideology is particularly Qian Lung, you know, at that period, you know, uh, um, um, uh, talks about. Okay. Now, he implicitly compares himself, you know, basically to all of these, uh, all of these people. And of course, finally, he comes from a lineage of a traitor. But it's not enough. Okay. Now, the, the, the governor of Shandong makes a very, very important, you know, that's why I got excited about it. It's a very important uh, thing. He says, like, this is considered completely absurd. Okay, not only that these people are uh, by by the law, he says, for example, in 1774, the traitor for Shoujang County, that's a, that's a county, another county in, Shandu, in uh, Shandong, not very far from there, okay, uh, Wang Lun, you know, gathered people to plot a rebellion. And the holy people, such as the Hong family, they actually mention a name. They mention, you know, a Muslim family in the case, in the report, yes. 
helped with the, uh, helped the officers and the soldiers of the Green Army that you know was sent to suppress the the rebellion, you know, to suppress the Bandit Party, and they made great efforts to save the empire, and it has been rewarded. So why did the offender? Okay, that is when you make false comparisons. This absurd comparison comparisons are really illegal. Okay, so now we have a case that you know the governor basically says like not only is this not, these are nice people. Okay, look well, look what they just did here very recently, and he makes a reference to a rebellion that you know uh, um, Sunakin uh, wrote about in 1977 or 1978. You know. Um, which is called the Wanglong or the uh, Wanglong Rebellion, which is a Buddhist-inspired rebellion in 1774 in Shandong, okay, led by Min uh, Wanglong. This is a novel that was uh, called The Three Lips of, uh, of Wanglong that was written by a German, okay? Um, and I put it here because we need to remember that Shandong in this period, you know, between 1900 and 1919 is actually colonized by the Germans. Okay, after they took it, uh, um, um, the coins by the Germans. So they were really into that idea that, like, studying the history of that place. And this man probably ran into this history and he basically brings Wang Lung back to life. And here's Suna Ken's book. And what's the story with Wang Lung? Okay, it's a, it's a White Lotus inspired rebellion. And Wang Lung, he was an herbalist. Okay, he was a very charismatic uh, uh, figure. He was doing martial arts. He was doing yoga. He was doing meditation. He was doing fasting, and he encouraged everybody also to uh, live longer by drinking purified water. If this man lived in Manhattan today, he'd be a guru. All you just need, you know, like degree in psychology. Okay. Now he gathers 4,000 people, and he starts a war. Okay, he starts a war, and he's actually in the beginning he's very very successful. Okay, they're doing all sorts of martial arts stuff. They think that they're doing magic. Of course, you can see here echoes of the Boxer Rebellion. Okay. And then he attacks Lin Qing. And I'm going to say a few words about Lin Qing, which are important, but the most important thing for us that this is in Western Shandong and it's on the Grand Canal. And that makes me very, very excited. Okay, this is a map of uh, Ling Qing, you know, uh, um, um, an image map from this period, and you can see it. Okay, and basically the Wang Lung uh, um, uh, armies, you know, are taking this strategic post on the Grand Canal, which is incredibly important, you know, because major harms not only for the province, but for everything north and south of that, because they're basically going to control the Grand Canal in there. Okay, so, um, and then the Muslims arrive. The Muslims save the day. They form a militia, they attack back, they help the empire, and they help defeat Wang Lung. Now, 10 years ago when we had this seminar, so um, uh, two students who have been graduated, Kevin and Tristan wrote a beautiful paper on Grand Canal uh, Muslim communities and also you know, their relationship with Buddhists. Okay, there's a lot of tension, uh, a lot of tension there. Okay, and one of the things that they described uh, um, that is very, very important, you know, is that, you know, these are communities that have settled there, settled along the Grand Canal. I did a lot of work on Muslim Islam in Beming, and I was able to document how, you know, you have a lot of migrants and a lot of internal migrants that the early Ming emperors settled on the Grand Canal with a lot of money that they bring in. They moved them probably from Fujiang. These are descendants of the merchants' communities that have existed before. Now they move in with money. They basically help stabilize the territory. They help stabilize, you know, the, the, these, these areas. Um, and they are quite full of themselves about that. Now, both uh, Professor Zelin and Professor Lin would know, you know, that I've been coming here every year and I was teaching, you know, teaching a family genealogy of the Hay family. Okay. So the Hay family, okay, talks about living in, in Linqing. And I've been... Uh, quite fascinated with this family because one of the uh, members of this family who lived in the beginning of the 18th century, he wrote um, a commentary on, you know, a collection, a commentary of one of the central Han Kita books, you know, which is what I was doing my dissertation, my first book about, you know, this is a 6, 1707, and, you know, he was a military official, high-ranking military official, you know, and then he also, they also had a, several versions of their family genealogy. And in their family genealogy, they talk about how they've been in China since the Tang period, which is a complete lie. 
and they were um they were everything's okay and then there's a little uh, um there's a little moment there you know i made a big deal out of this in, in an earlier article when they say even when the ming were coming to power you know we survived that means that they served the mongols okay and they didn't expect to survive but they did okay and then they say you know we moved to Linqing, and we moved 18 families you know, 18 Muslim families, and we are proud, and we are happy settlers. They end up with an exclamation mark, say, we are happy settlers here. We built a place, okay? We built this city, okay? Um, that is an echo that I don't have a lot of time to substantiate, but this is an echo of the, of the early Ming period where, you know, the Ming is actually strategically moving Muslim families from different areas, both in the Southwest in Yunnan, where they are too strong and too powerful because they were in Mongol garrisons there, but also in the Southeast, you know, areas in Fujian and Canton. And then they do, then they uh, basically a certain patchwork, a certain archipelago of Muslim communities that are connected, but they have this prestige that, you know, they are highly connected to the Ming. And the Khais are one of them, and they mention 18 other clans. Okay, the chains, the tours, all of this stuff, they don't mention the horns. Okay, so the anxious, anxious historian rushes, first of all, to Suna Ken's book, and he wants to read all the, the information about the Wanglong Rebellion. And in the, in the Qing documents about suppressing the Wanglong Rebellion, there's plenty of evidence of Hui militias. In other words, Muslim militias that were formed and basically helped suppress the rebellion. No Hui's and no Hongs. Okay, so I go back to the Hai family genealogy and I read it even more carefully. And sure enough, in addition that it comes out in the 18th century, there's a notation that said, we fought against the Wang Lung uh, rebellion. We, the Hais of Linqing, fought against the Wang Lung rebellion. Okay, so now I have actually evidence, you know, from at least one family which I'm actually quite proud that they did that. But, you know, the, the, there's some lacks that you can, you know, and here's a, another morphology that I'm going to talk about. A book recently came out and it was a, an amazing miracle. Okay, I think that, uh, I think that, you know, my colleague here also worked on that book. Okay, and it was such a miracle, first of all, because it came out, and second of all, you could order this during COVID from China on Amazon, and it arrived within two weeks. Okay, so I read a lot of stelae and a lot of, you know, uh, Chinese uh, Muslim epigraphy. And then there was a, an epigraphy, there was a steal from Guangdong in 1697 by a man who built a cemetery for poor Muslims in Guangdong. And that man's his name is Hong, from the Hong family, and he was from Guangdong, he was a Cantonese Muslim. And he says that he moved from, uh, from uh, Guangdong to Minqing, yes, um, and settled there, but he came back to his hometown, original hometown in Guangdong, because his son passed away. And in order to order his son, yes, he dedicated a cemetery for poor Muslims. And this is the stele that, uh, um, that was erected there, him and his wife, you know, and there's uh, some exp explanations about Islam and so on and so forth. And this is 100 years before the period that we're talking about, or eight years before the period we're talking about. Now, so we're talking about a certain uh, uh, Hong family that was rich enough in Linqing Okay, to go in, in the late 17th century to go and buy a cemetery, build a cemetery for the poor in Guangdong. These, I suggest to you that these are the Hongs who are mentioned in the memo of the emperor, of the memo of Guotai during the accusation, you know, 80 years later. Must be the same, the same family. And now we can understand how they help. They raise money, they do that. Now, why would Muslims, you know, in Shandong in particular, be hostile to uh, um, be supportive of the empire or supportive of the dynasty and be hostile to a, a Buddhist army that is suddenly attacking the city, I think it's quite clear. We may want to go the religious path and say, you know, they saw these people like, is, is particularly intolerable idolaters, you know, all of this, think about all of this, it's like very irritating, all the meditation, the fasting, you know, it's annoying today, it would be annoying then, all the, the ceremonies they were doing, etc., plus the idolatry, okay, but more importantly, socially, okay, these people are connected to the emperor. They are connected to the Ming dynasty. They settled there under the auspices of the Ming dynasty. That's their thing. They probably were worried about how during the Ming Qing transition, but they're now really there, you know, serving the empire on the Grand Canal. Okay, the last thing they want as a minority is a Buddhist rebellion, you know, against the dynasty, the ruling dynasty that will disrupt the state and destroy the province. So it's very, very clear why they want to do that. 
okay? So now we have that connection as well. And we can see also that it's quite remarkable. I mean, I have plenty of other evidence. I already know now that I cannot go to the second case, but maybe in the Q&A. But plenty of evidence that actually Muslim families moved and they made notations, either, you know, in, uh, all sorts of epigraphies such as still eyes or book prefaces and so on, or in the family genealogies. And these, these movements, you know, resonate and you can really, really, if you match them to Chinese, to, to Chinese history and, and Chinese chronology, you can match them to different moments in Chinese history that explain why they moved. Okay, I don't have an explanation why this particular family moved, you know, but for others I do more. Okay, so now it looks like I solved all the story. Why he was a traitor, what did he do, why you know, they, 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 they make the case and everything. And then you move on and you say, wouldn't it be nice to actually read the local gazetteer of the Shoguan County? And yes, it's very nice because there was a gazetteer that was published in 1800 when uh, Guotai was still uh, alive. Guotai, by the way, was a, mem was a member of, a clique of, her of the clique of Hershen, one of the most notorious officials in that period. Yes, um, he, he and the Minister of Treasury of the Finances of the Shandong County embezzled big time. You know, when Hershen started the war, you know, Chen Long was really, really afraid. He ordered both of them to commit suicide. That happens two years after. But when the gazetteer comes out in 1800, he's still alive, okay? And he's still kicking and embezzling and accusing people of treason. But in 1936, in 1936, there is a new edition of the Gazetteer coming out. So I rushed to this Gazetteer and thank God for Wikimedia Commons. This is unbelievable to do all of this. It's an outrage. You know, everything that you want is downloadable. Okay. I was filled with a humbleness to my younger self, you know, because I started working on this before, you know, all of the, before the internet but also mostly to our teachers who are doing all of this work before, you know, and we just download it and can do all sorts of searches there and find things. And lo and behold, I find Wei Xu in that volume. So there is a very, very brief notation. I was expecting to hear all the gory details, all the juicy part, nothing. No, they mentioned that, you know, an upright official by the name of Wei Xu was executed. Upright official? You look at the section of the gazetteer, it's actually, it's, he's located in what we call filial piety, okay? How come? What do you mean filial piety? I mean, there was, the man was a traitor, a xenophobe, writing all of this stuff. And then you begin to suspect that what you've been reading in the case against Wei Shu has much more into it, okay? And then you look more, and you discover a little book which is basically the, mem the proverbs of the people of the Shogun Kwan County. That they had a nice edition that came out, you know, uh, uh, um, in, the seven, in the 1980s. And they have a proverb that is completely local just for the people in that county. And that proverb says, reason, do not be head, waste you. And you use, it, you use it when you basically are engaged in a heated docu uh, argument with someone and you don't want them to do something really, really brutal and hasty. So you say, reason, don't be head. They should. Just imagine when you go to a departmental meeting and you have a fight over a student and they say, reason, don't be head, a boy issue. That's like the idea. And then you read the story behind the proverb. And the proverb, I argue, encapsulates the memory of the people of Shoguang, how they remembered what happened to Wei Shu. And it's very interesting because there are no Muslims in this story at all. In fact, there are no Muslims in the Shogun County at all. The people who make the connections are the governors, okay? And Wei Shu himself who just made the comparison. And what's the story be behind that proverb? So it says that Wei Shu was a, was a nice guy and he lived there. And, you know, there was a drought in the, in the area. There was a problem, you know, with a lot of, uh, um, there was no rice. There was no uh, revenue for, and the peasants were starving. But when the governor and the magistrate wanted to collect taxes and to, to complete very, very evil, Wei Shu protested in the name of the peasants and says, you know, don't be so harsh on taxation at this harsh year. And then he went to meet the, this is how the people tell the story. And he went to meet the magistrate and the magistrate says, listen, if you side with us and help us convince the peasants, 
you know, to finance, our, to, finance uh, to, to pay their taxes this year, they raise the taxes as well, they actually increase the taxes in this year, you know, you will be benefiting from that. And where she stood like a good upright uh, official and said, no way, I will not support you. I'm standing with the peasants. And he was killed. That's how the people of Shogun remember, this, remember the story. Okay. That's the second case, which I'm not going to go into today, no time. And now you think, and I will conclude with that. And now you start thinking, okay, what was going on here? Okay. We have two completely different stories. One, we have the official documentation of a man accused making very, very uh, uh, um, uh, serious, uh, uh, treasonable uh, statements that I hope I made the case why he would look like a traitor in the eyes of the Chen Lung. Yes. But then you think, okay, why did the Chen Lung Emperor actually move from leniency to death? You know, why did they have to rethink the case? Why suddenly they build the case? Why is the, the Guotai is so into like, making that case, invoking the Hong, invoking the Wanglung rebellion, saying that the Muslims are so nice people. If, if I went to the other case, you see that other governors were quite convinced that the Muslims are horrible, you know, at that period. Okay. This man looks like, appears to be very, very, very poor Muslim. Okay. As of like going out of his way. And then, I decided I want to reconcile the oral history or I, the history behind the proverb that is being told, that is encapsulated in the proverb. Um, there's a scene there, that, you know, one of his uncles who was a governor somewhere else of Weishu's uncles went back to, the, to, the, to Shandong and he, he pleaded with Guotai not to kill Weishu and he said to him, you know, reason don't, don't behead Weishu and this is how immortalized in the proverb. Okay. And, and and so I, I decided that actually what was going on is a, something a little different, okay? Then there are some clues. The timing was incredibly bad. It is exactly the timing when the Chenlong Emperor is doing his fifth southern, um, southern uh, tour. And as this episode with the taxation is going on and with Wei Shu protesting the taxation, he was actually in the Shandong province. And he was about to climb Mount, Mount, Taishai, Mount, Mount Taishai, Taishan. That explains a lot of things that I can only speculate about. It explains why the governors were so interested in raising money because the governors, the local governors, as the emperor was traveling, you know, along the Grand Canal South, they were financing his, his stops and we're talking about an enormous amount of money. Okay, just think about the Western Lake, okay? down south uh, um, in the Jiangnan area. You know, it was built in, the, it's actually not, yeah, it's not in the Jiangnan, but they pretend to be in the Jiangnan, okay? Um, the Western Lake, I mean, they build all of these palaces, you know, so we can see it's a show to show the, how the, the province is thriving and prosperous, okay? That's why they're keen on having a lot of money. And when this man disrupts them, yes, and say, you can't tax the peasants in this area, you know, they're really, 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 you know, upset, okay? More importantly, it also explains why the communication with the emperor is so fast. Okay? He's in there. He's right there, not very probably right there, okay? in Minqing, okay? which is a Grand Canal post. No wonder why they mention Muslims from Linqing, you know, saving the day. You know, they want to make the case for him. Okay? And he, first of all, he understands that this is not a treasonable act. Because the Chen Lung, no one knew letters like the Chen Lung Emperor. I mean, if I, if, if I could get to the other case, you can see how he played with words and played with his governors. But he understood, you know, that this is not a serious case, you know, but I think. But, you know, they were making the case for him repeatedly and increasing that, you know, the saying this is a treasonable act. And, you know, basically they executed that, um, that uh, ended up executing that man and leaving us with this proverb. So to reconcile to, the, the two stories together, I actually think, you know, there's a lot of truth in both of them. In other words, yes, you know, I mean, he, he had some very problematic uh, notations that he wrote that could be construed as problematic if someone wanted to and make a very, very good case in the time for Muslims in Shandong. It also makes the case that, you know, we can see why in Shandong there's plenty of tensions between Muslims and non-Muslims in this area. In 1730, Lu Guohua, the earlier uh, um, governor of Shandong, wrote a memo to the Yongzheng emperor condemning Muslims. And the Yongzheng emperor actually ended up, you know, saying the Muslims are the children of the empire. Don't be that harsh on them. Yes. 
we can understand now that you know these are not just Muslims; these are very, very specific Muslims. These are actually Muslims who are not who are for foreign in the sense that kind of foreigners, not foreigners on account of being Muslims. They move there under the auspices of the dynasty. They live on the Grand Canal. They're not exactly part of the fabric of the of the of the province, and also they have all sorts of issues with with Buddhists in this area. Okay, so there's point of tension. I take this to the 19th century and I show why it is not a coincidence to my mind that the only apologetic text, really apologetic text that about Islam is produced in that province, okay? Um, and actually it's a text that valorizes the Ming, okay? Um, and the, the connections of the Muslims with the Ming. So that speaks to Sandung, one minute, yes. The second thing that uh, um, it tells me is the power, um, so that speaks to, to that uh, um, uh, part in terms of, you know, the, the, um, um, the Muslims in this area and so on. And also that speaks to the power of you know the way things are remembered, Muslims feature in the accusation as people who are all over the place. They play a central role in the rebellion. They are play a central role in the territories. They are law abiding and they are nice people all over the empire. Some people imagine them this way. Other people imagine them the other way. Okay, as I show. But locally, I mean, the people who remember the case of Weishu have nothing to do with Muslims. For them, you know, this was an upright official. Okay, who basically stood for them and lost his life uh, uh, for that. And it speaks about, I think, the elusiveness of, you know, minorities in China, how you use them and to what purpose, yes? Um, according to the changing situation in certain geographies within the empire, yes, or within, you know, the People's Republic of China, and according to specific times, you know, within the empire or within, you know, the, the history and so on. And with that, that hint to the present moment, I'm going to finish. Thank you. So I think we can stop uh, these skills actually uh, on display, in, 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 especially in terms of you know his ability to look at minutiae in the margin and then spin a tremendously ambitious, uh, not a story, but uh, an account, a historical analysis that, that is in and of itself a form of morphology, where we get a sense, right, we see span from the Han all the way to the 20th century, uh, and we get a sense of how tropes about Muslims are very, very powerful in creating the continuity of you know, this longer history that you're trying to, 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 to talk about. But before, um, the thing is, let's start and open up the um, floor uh, with questions, perhaps. We'll start with some questions. Um, what? Okay. Okay. So, okay. Do I need to go to the podium to watch the? Okay. So, okay. So maybe I'll I'll work from the podium, and then to me you can okay. uh, you can field. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. So, so anyway, Josh Bogle, hello, wonderful talk. <laughs> So let's let's start with let's open up that. any questions for Sue about Wei Shu, whether he is a Muslim or not, according to the Shango proverb, he is or treasonous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, treasonous. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. So with Maddie So I don't know if it's fair to do this, but but it's you started out the talk um giving us the sense that that this was an example of micro history that and it, it was part of your effort to try and understand how you write a map in this Yes. And I'm wondering if you want to elaborate more on that topic. Because you know, a lot of us, I think, have, I mean, I would have called it, you know, a case. And, and often with my students, I'd say it's very nice to start with a case and then move into its larger significance. And I, I'm curious what some of your, you know, sort of, not necessarily analytical, but but actually strategic um, thoughts have been on using that kind of a methodology to, to illuminate something that's in, as important as the way in which most of us have been the channels. Yes, I mean this also speaks to the to the historiography of, of Chinese Islam that you know peaked, particularly in the past twenty years, and I think in the past decade, because one of the things that we see. We see, we begin with a history that was like as of one single whole, one single religion. This is how the Jesuits uh, view this. 
you know, the, the early Jesuits basically see the Muslims in China as Moors. Okay? In other words, they see them as, as people who are, the fact that they're Muslims basically make them, you know, as medieval Arabs in their eyes. Okay, so we begin with one single hall, and then the more we proceed, um, particularly in the present moment of the studies of Chinese Islam, we, we increasingly emphasize diversity, we emphasize, you know, the multiplicity of histories, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then at the end of the day, we need to, we need to always to come back to the moment that someone did see these people as one single whole, both in terms of the unified religion, which is not. Okay, it's, it, it, there are many, many Islams in Chinese Islam and different communities there as well. Okay, so I would say that the, 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 the connections that the task of the historian is to see how these connections are made. Okay, and I would say in this case, I was not able to dwell on all of them, but I can have some hints. One is the ge is geographies, okay? But these are very, very, so you have to do surgical geography. You understand that basically we're talking about not Chinese Islam, but we're talking about the Grand Canal Islam, okay? And I wish I had known that when I was doing my research for the first book, because I, I, I understood a little bit, but I didn't understand that what we have here is actually communities who are wealthy enough and they have the sense of themselves because they, you know they have very strong connections with the with the emperor, you know this way or the other historical connections, okay. And this is actually internal settlements that the government of the Ming and later on the Qing supported and, and encouraged. So that's one one connection, okay. Uh, that I make that goes over time. But then at the end of the day, it pours into the one single whole. okay. Because when they write about it, they say, oh, I had a, a quarrel with the Buddhist. And you know, and the Buddhist uh, a, a debate about religion with the with the Buddhist, and the Buddhist ended up, you know, converting to Islam. Okay, or it speaks to the fact that you know now we can understand a little bit why you know there were tensions between Muslims in in in, in Buddhist in Shandu per se. So, in micro history, plays a lot of emphasis, you know, to small space. Okay, and a lot, and and then say let's extrapolate from that. So, if you look at the history of Islam in Shandu, you will see that the government settled a lot of Muslims who came from Central Asia during the Ming, and they, they allowed them to stay in China, but they didn't want them to be in Be too close to Beijing. So they shipped them to Shandong, okay? Um, and they basically gave them a Chinese name, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But then I want to also make connections, okay? Not to create a one single whole, but let's say, let's call it a Parmedian whole about Chinese Islam. So it's very important that the Hongs actually have connections to Guangdong, okay? Um, it's very important that the case that I couldn't uh, talk about is very important that, you know, uh, um, the uh, uh, people travel along specific lines, you know, that they know. In other words, if you are a Muslim in China and you want to travel, you know which routes to take. You know where you're going to find Muslim communities because you're not going to find them everywhere. So we're talking about a connected archipelago. And this connected archipelago, at least on the east side, Yes, tragically, I'm more familiar with the East, Eastern China than Western China, okay? But I'm actually talking about how Western China is imagined from Eastern China. You see that these people actually know who they are and they are connected through the waterways, they are connected through trades, uh, connections of, of, of trade, uh, um, um, et cetera. And that actually defined their, defined their Islam no less than their religion to a certain extent, okay? So yes, I mean, the danger of, of, of micro history that you focus on tiny little things and you know, then you know you are unable to make the connections. I think my task is actually to make the connections within reason and see if we can bring, bring it to, to a situation where you know, this, the Communist Party of China in 1948 you know, is, making, is able to say, okay, all of these people are but one single nationality. I know I'm not answering the question, but I'm trying. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll let it go for now. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and thank you for the fascinating and impressive. I wanted to ask about that. I mean, there, there seems to be a lot of tension here. So, I mean, you said how people were, you know, how people remember, people were remembered. There's also a lot about historical production, right? And kind of mm -hmm. in the most formal, official historical production by the emperor himself and, and his project into. I guess smaller, less formal, even though it's very bit so official. And um, you have a paragraph that ended with, uh, that's a great one. I wrote about the Hong Kong. Yeah. Right? And I was wondering, what is later? That he was supposedly wrong? Or that he's condemning someone who was, I mean, you understand what I'm yeah. saying? 
Yeah. Um, the, the thing is that, you know, I mean, when you look at this, uh, you, we're entering in an interesting terrain here and we don't have a lot of text, but I think that they are findable. In other words, you have plenty of censorship cases that come up of that period. And let's look at the censorship cases again and see, you know, actually how the uh, locality plays into it. Okay, that is for quote unquote mainstream China cases. But let, if we talk about Muslims or maybe other types of foreigners, let's see how the people who make the accusation build the case. Okay, and they, I think that when they build the case, they can make a big deal out of something that is not a big deal because they need to convince the convince the emperor to execute someone. And it may look like the you know the Chinese government was trigger happy on this. They were not necessarily this case. I mean, in the other case that I was hoping to present, actually the, the emperor reverses the entire accusation and says, leave these people alone after they've been tortured. He releases them, okay? Um, so to say, to say that something is illegal, it's not according to the law. Because if you went to the civil codes of that period, you will see that actually that, you know, in that period, you have, there's a development, Jonathan Lippmann has written about it already well before, you know, that actually there are different, uh, different laws for Muslims and non-Muslims, okay? And they are somewhat discriminated against and they are harshly punished, you know, when they commit a crime, okay? But here, it is about, you know, understanding, you know, the present moment of China and trying to make a case because you want someone to, uh, uh, to execute. And when they say that is illegal, it's usually it's not illegal. We are saying it's illegal, okay? Because the emperor is supposed to, supposed to understand immediately what's legal and not legal. He is the law, okay? But here, so so I, I would say it's about, when they say this is illegal, it's about, you know, setting a precedent at the same time. They feel that they're setting the precedent at the same time. I mean, there's something else going on here. When they make the case, they act as philologists. They understand the present moment. They understand the connections. They know when to make a direct accusation and they know when to apply, imply one, okay? That's why I think they do not mention the, the, the official who served the Ming and moved to the Qing. It's a tricky thing. It's not clear exactly how Chen Nung thinks about it. We, they have just learned that Chen Nung actually doesn't think highly of those officials who served both the Ming and the Qing, the way his grand, unlike his grandfather, who did like them, okay? So you have a lot of suggestion there, okay? And in this, in this dialogue between the emperor and the governors who are making the accusation, and you know, if you work on these cases, maybe it's a good idea to revisit them and see these uh, um, small, tiny moments where they make boastful cases, and then when they retreat and they just say, okay, I mean, I'm just gonna imply that and put it in here for you to think about. Okay, so it has nothing to do with the written law. The task, uh, the task of the historian is actually, in fact, to the best of their ability is to reconstruct these moments and try to guess or speculate, you know, within reason what they're trying to suggest and how they establish illegality. And what word do they use for illegality? Um, I, when I was preparing that this morning, I was I erased the the characters to make it more simple, but I promise. It's, as soon as I open my computer, I'm sending you the, the Because I mean, that yeah. would tell you partly whether or not yeah. you really worship the or not. And, and there is, false accusation is an extremely serious crime. Yes. So it's possible that they were invoking, they could have been invoking law, or they could have been speaking more symbolically. Yeah. In fact, when they when they be, begin to build the case, they say, okay, we, this man was involved in a case of forgery, but they actually make a point that he wasn't one of the forgers himself. He just wrote a petition on behalf of one of the sides in the party that was accusing each other of, of, of forgery. And they and you can see how they build the case towards the Muslims, that they are not interested in that at all. They just use it as an explanation as to why they searched his home. And this is important because, you know, in the other case, it is a, it's a Muslim who is arrested. And I actually think that he was arrested because they thought he was a Buddhist. The man was balding, he had a skin disease, and he was traveling in the Guilin area. And he looked like, he didn't have a pigtail, he looked like he was a Buddhist monk, okay? Because I asked myself, like, why did they search him? Why did they arrest him? Okay, I have a couple of uh, comments. I have uh, collecting names. I think, David, your hand is up next. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Lee. Um, <clears throat> so you took a turn towards social history in the, the second half of the talk, but the first half I was mostly thinking about the, the other narrative, which has already come up a little bit, this question of the Chenlong Emperor and his attitude towards Muslims. 
Yeah. Um, and it's, but I'm finding it a little bit hard to pin down exactly. You didn't present that much evidence for his precise reasoning for his yes. take on the situation. I mean, you presented a variety of different possibilities, the, the Archan stuff, the idea that he's being analogized to this failed emperor or the possibility that he's actually genuinely angry at this guy for slandering Muslims. Now, I was wondering how plausible you think that is in this particular point in time. You know, Chenlong's being pulled in different directions. In terms of policy towards Islam in this period, there's definitely examples of him sort of pronouncing, you know, in, in a kind of, I mean, to use an anachronistic term, you know, a tolerant mode, but the idea of him actually sentencing someone to death for saying bad things about Muslims is something that I'm, you know, I don't know how common that sort of thing would be. So can, can you fit this kind yes. of more precisely into this story? Yeah, I ran out of time and I was actually going to discuss this much more. I mean, this is the period, you know, when there's a lot of work on Xinjiang. And he is heavily involved in that. And I would mention two things that really play into it very, very strongly. Number one, this is the time when they build the mosque in, in, uh, in Beijing, um, when the fragrant concubine is arriving and she's a Muslim from Xinjiang. But here's the thing. I, I published an article five years ago analyzing, you know, the circumstances there, you know, in questions of sovereignty. And he, you see, when he, I believe now that he dictated that still I, that still that they put on the mosque because there has a line that basically speaks to Qing universalism in the sense is like I speak the languages of all my, my uh, uh, subjects and I go close to them, I bring them to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's like not about tolerance. It's actually about, you know, I would say Qing universalism and, you know, the idea of being the emperor of everyone. And then there's a note there that he says, you know, bowing south, bowing west, bowing north, you know, it's the same thing. Okay. Now, what does it mean? The mosque is facing north towards the throne, but it's supposed to, force, it's supposed to face west towards Mecca. And he knows that that's very, very problematic. He actually knows that, but he can't, he can't build a mosque that is facing to Mecca. And he kind of saying, okay, you know, facing north, facing west, uh, it's the same thing. In other words, I'm equal to Muhammad. It's a wishful thinking. He wasn't, okay, from a religious point of view, but from a political point of view, it betrays that he's aware of all of these things. And also that there is a keen, you, you have more and more evidence when you look into it, that the community in Beijing around that particular mosque that they actually, I don't think that they ever attended, you know, it's very, very close, you know, in terms of, you know, politicking in the court, okay? And in the other case, I concluded, I wrote about it and I, I think I missed the point completely at that time. I mean, I didn't miss it entirely, but um, they, they, you can see them involved in, you know, the, him being lenient against the Muslims who were accused, and he says they are law-abiding and so on. We see the same thing with some evidence with Kang Shi, and we see the same thing uh, uh, with, with Yong Zheng as well, when they make some, uh, um, some uh, interference on Muslims. But they don't generally say, I'm pro-Muslim. It's a case-by-case -case, uh, event, and there's a lot of politics uh, involved. In this particular case, in this particular case, you know, in both sides, you see that the emperor is, is, is consistent in the sense that he defends Muslims, but he, don't, he doesn't defend the Muslims in the Northwest where there's plenty of wars. You know, this is the, uh, uh, several rebellions are going on and the Qing army is actually fighting real Muslims in the Northwest at that particular time, exactly at that time. So it actually speaks to the fact that he wants to keep the, the Eastern sides uh, uh, quiet um, and, and, and so on. I would say that, particularly the Chenlong Emperor knows a lot more about Islam. He doesn't understand the religion. It's not about that he is a, being a student of Islam, but he understands a lot more what it means, you know, to be a Muslim in his empire. Okay. So can do the other thing we hear. But we have done we see beyond that to see there's a problem in Japan, which had a little problem for around 1600s, back and forth. And they're bringing Chinese in to live and operate in Okagawa, Japan, as it finds itself. So we have that going on. We have the far west, are they Mongols? Are they Manchus? 
but if you're not Chinese, what are you? Yeah. Um, and the roles of the, the, the convention in the world of the you know, Mongo makes it secondary. In fact, it's not. So we need to be working. I think the other side that you've done so well with it, and I just want to read the answer one again, is the uh, Beijing was never a, Ch a Chinese city for a period of time. They brought people in, they lived in one of the cities, but it was in the Chinese city itself that there were Chinese. In the northern capital, there, there were no Chinese there. They only allowed the government that they got off their horses and entered the, the, the site and worked on the mountain. Yeah. There's a lot of complexity involved that we left out in the earlier research. Maybe we were an avenue for the story. I think we can add it. The question is what are the, what, 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 what did the story of the, the branches tell us in relationship to the local and the other groups that we've lived in so well? Where did the community notion that the battle between those two regions in Beijing itself? And Beijing is not really a, a, a Chinese city. Yeah, I'm very, I'm going to be in blue way before you're barely beginning to build the city. The, the, the residents of the mountain were far outside of the town. It was a very complicated story. And I was going to sort of sort of comments that you had to be in the early green deadlines. You kind of were doing a story. Yes. Um, that speaks actually to to that comment speaks actually to the biggest elephant in the room, the biggest mammoth in the room, which is what are the what's the status of the Manchus in that particular period? Are we supposed to remind them that they are barbarians or not? And in the second case, I go through huge mountains of philology to show how specific verses from the Mengzi yes, are used by the governors to make an accusation against a Muslim without saying, well, we accuse this man that he's making a comparison between you guys, you Manchus, and the barbarians. They keep hinting at that, but it's like, it's like you want to talk to someone and you don't want to mention, listen, it's about you, but I can't really say it's about you, okay? And in that case, when you see the other memos, you see that they are silent on the issue of the, of the, the okay, well, anti-barbarian text, this is actually about the Manchus themselves. Okay, that you're right, it's been revived in that context, you know, the foreigners and the barbarian is being revived. Okay, and of course, New Qing history and, you know, uh, um, made us more aware that they were far more sensitive to their, to, to, to these issues than we thought before, because we thought that, you know, before it was like the kind of nicely signified, and that was okay, and they were okay with that. But it's interesting to look how, you know, they, the governor and the other officials in Shandong don't make that accusation. They say, oh, you know, he just compared, you know, the, the five tribes to you, to you, Manchus, you know, that's, and then that's it. So sell the case. In other words, even to accuse someone in hinting, you know, about the foreign origins of the Manchus themselves, you know, in a certain political way, you know, would be a problem. But Eric. Thank you, Sri. This was fascinating. Um, I had a comment and a quick question. Uh, my comment is the uh, the five tribes uh, Wu Wu is uh, fascinating to me because um, they're back today. The discourse of them in relation to Muslims, but in a somewhat different style, where it's no longer so much about uh, treason and letting people in or out, but um, the actually the, the person who's now the head of the Ethnic Affairs Commission in in China, Pan Yue, has written a lot on the on this. Um, he talks about how the five tribes are a great model of the assimilative, assimilative power of China, and they became Han. And so like them, so too will the other 55 minority nationalities. Um, but then he sort of juxtaposes Islam as a kind of especially uh, resistant uh, alien element that is uh, kind of, uh, you know, the problem. And so, that it's, so, so it's interesting then that, again, they're back, but the, it's not so much uh, five tribes equal Islam, but more can Muslims be made into the five tribes? Comment. Yeah. Question though is just on this issue of um, Maddie raised uh, the the phrase of uh, false accusations, and I wonder, following up on that, if if that's sort of you know you framed this as about treason. To me, this is about, um, and you also gestured toward the Haifurun case in yes. one of your previous comments. Um, isn't this a story of Qianlong and other ch like Chinese, like Qing emperors before him saying, don't fan the flames of xenophobia or kind of Islamophobia uh, just to kind of rile people up. I'm going to see through it, uh, right? It, this is sort of about keeping 
keeping the eye on the ball, so to speak, of, of the empire and not getting distracted by claims of these immigrants or these uh, Muslims are coming in and they're everywhere. Yes. Okay. First of all, for the comment, you know, there's a reason why I was so hooked on that particular thing, because it carries me to the present moment, which is very, very important. And, and you know, for that comment, you know, as Benjamin and anyone used to say in seminar rooms, when you when a student made a particularly nice one, you know, you will attain nirvana for this one. Because the point is that this is about, I think, at the end of the day, how these histories are used at different moments, you know. In 299, it's clearly a completely a completely horrible thing. And, you know, Jiang Tong is taking them all the way back to the Shang Dynasty and say they existed already there and they were disruptive already there, you know. And then, you know, in the 18th century, he may, uh, Wei Shu is making the case that these are basically the more, his present day Muslims. And now, you know, because the empire wants to bring Muslims back and, and they, they use the, these, these uh, uh, people um, as an example of, you know, successful uh, assimilation. Okay, so thank you for uh, thank you for that. As to the question of treason, I mean, since uh, since Ken Guy, I mean uh, Ken Guy's book on the on the Sikh Chuan Shu and the cases of the Inquisition, we need to really think about what we mean by treason in that period. Now, in this point, in the Haifaru case, you know, they actually don't accuse him of of, of, of treason. Okay, it's about my argument that this is about rereading the Mencius and rereading the way the Chen Lung himself read specific passages in the Mencius. Okay, that's the play there. That's the implicit dialogue with the emperor that not the Muslims are doing, but the governors who are doing the commission. But in that particular case, and they do not, I don't think that they use the term high treason. In that particular case, they specifically say high treason. And they don't, I, they didn't convince me, but they convinced the emperor. Okay, and it, it was immortalized as the case of uh, high treason. So that's the, the, the word that they use in, in, in that context. Okay, it is true. And, you know, we can go back to, you know, to cases of soul stealers that were, so it, it is true that the emperor, the, the Chenung emperor fashioned himself as someone who was going to see through every, every lie that his governors were trying to tell him. And in fact, Harold Khan debated that with, uh, with, uh, um, um, the author of Soul Stealer escaped me. Philo Kyung. Kyung, yeah, yeah. I mean, he debated that. He says, like, well, you know, do you really think that there was a real such a quarrel between the emperor and his uh, his governors? I think now Philip Kyung was quite right. Okay, but in a way, I'll ask today to show how the the governors themselves were understanding this and how they were playing with the uh, with the emperor. Okay. Marcus, you had your hand up. Marcus, no. Oh, no, 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 uh, sorry. This fellow right here, did you have your hand up? Me? Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ignatius, and my question is how you uh, reconcile the fact that Chinese Muslims in the hygiene period were treated like uh, decently, but uh, the Chinese Catholics, uh, Chinese Christians in that period were uh, persecuted and the, the religious churches were banned. Yes. You will also attend Nirvana for making this comment. Okay, <laughs> let's go back to the quick edict that I mentioned in uh, uh, by Yong Zheng, the Yong Zheng Emperor in 1730. So the Yong Zheng Emperor in 1730, he gets a memo from uh, um, uh, the governor of Shandong at that time, also a hater of Muslims, or not a hater of Muslims, a hater of Muslims as opposed to this guy who was like a defender of Muslims. Yes, and he says, "Yeah, the Muslims are all over the place and they are bad, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And then the Yong Zheng Emperor says. They are the children of the empire. And he compares them to the Jesuits. And here's the thing. The Jesuits at that period are doing something that the Muslims apparently don't do. They proselytize. They want to convert the empire. And Jung Jin doesn't like that. Okay. And there's a big deal that I make a lot of this uh, in different ways. I'm going to mention only two cases. First of all, the Muslims became very, very proud of that. You know, we don't proselytize, we don't convert, we don't do anything. You know, this is the Jesuit and the Catholic stuff. You know, that's why they are persecuted. So it's a different type of, you know, xenophobia on the part of the emperor. The emperor doesn't like that, you know, the children, his children are being, being made, turn into some, something else. Okay. The second thing, if you move into the 20th century, particularly the Republican period, where Muslims begin to build a new identity for themselves within the context of a nation, they bring the Catholics again and again and again, and they say, we do not 
we did not proselytize. We just come here. Okay. You know, we didn't want to change China. We didn't come here to change China. We come to be the children of the empire or be, to be part of the nation. It's very, very important the comparison that they make. Final point. Matteo Ricci, I've been, I just finished uh, more over a decade of, of rereading every single thing that Matteo Ricci ever wrote about Muslims. And I concluded, by the way, that he never spoke with a Muslim even once. I can make the case that he spoke with one Jew and all of the information, which is quite accurate, that he has about Muslims is coming from that Jew. The Jew I, and I call him the Jew Oi. Okay. Um, but the point that he says, he says, he says they live their lives they have their mosques, they circumcise, and they do not proselytize. He makes a point that the Muslims do not proselytize. Because, by the way, that's what exactly he's doing. Okay. Um, so, in other words, even the Jesuits themselves, you know, and I gave three examples, you know, one from the 1730, one from 16, 1582, and one from the 1940s. This idea of what you do in China matters a lot, you know, whether you proselytize or not. And now that raises a very interesting question about the status of religions of China. Why is it that if you're a Buddhist or if you are some, you know, other religion, you know, that moves from Asian religion that moves into China, that's not about proselytization. Why is it that we use the term proselytization when we talk about the so-called three monotheistic religions, or at least the two of them? Okay, um, that's a different that's a, that's a different question, and actually speaks to the history of religions in Asia in terms of you know what Kant used to call you know theological geography. In other words, how different religions spread. You know, and what are the mechanisms that spread? Yes, the Muslims didn't proselytize anybody, but pretty much, you know, it's the same territory that was largely Buddhist until the 8th century in the Indian Ocean in, in the Central Asia becomes pretty, pretty Muslim in the 12th century. Some, it, someone was doing that, okay? But, you know, you see how, you know, China itself is kind of isolated as a territory that you don't do this. You just come to live there. Yeah. Okay, Yes, yes. Um, I'm just the first time I've done this project. Um, um, so, uh, I'm really surprised by your notion of the family place. My husband to leave in Beijing, and now I can, I just cannot see the you know, Muslim restaurant the same way that I did. Um, so, the way that you make connections with uh, between Muslims and Tantra and Muslims and those many governors remind me also of the like, interior household merchants, like dental merchants or all of them. Yeah. So I'm wondering what kind of occupation were those Muslims uh, involved in? Were they part of the white of the Tantra to return sources? That's the first question. Um, the second question is more about the conceptual. So how did the changer have that Tantra talk about? The two ways, the, the Muslim in Northwest China and the Muslim on the East Coast. Do they use different terms or words? Yeah. Um, so I think the second, the first question was about specific occupations. Yes. So they do all sorts of services, and we need to look at them at different moments, you know, starting from the Ming. Okay. I think in terms of the early Ming period, it's about, you know, finances. Okay, it's it, these are rich families, you know, that thrive during the Mongol period, and the Ming is very much interested in having them using their money on one and B, you know, not having them concentrated in one place, you know, where they can be too strong. One of the painful moments of the early Ming is that the Muslims, some Muslim garrisons in Fujian and also in Yunnan rebelled against the Ming and they will remain loyal to the Mongols. Okay. So the, the second thing is actually stabilizing different areas. Okay. So the tale of, oh, we settled in Shandong, that the family is boasting about, they did do invest in these areas. I mean, we're not talking about peasantry yet. In Yunnan, we do talk about peasantry, okay? because these were soldiers, they were garrisons, and they actually did become peasants. But in these areas, I would say it's, it's trade. Um, certainly some connections to Central Asia that is, are hard to establish, but you have clues in, in you know, um, in different places that they are, they somehow trade with, with Central Asia, but it's trade along the trade along the canal with, you know, spe there are specific, there are specific things that they trade in. Okay. And in many ways, I would say that it is that the government sees them as a source of stability. Um, in the Wang Lung case, you know, which is unique, they do raise money and they create a militia and they apparently save the day. Um, 
And then, you know, I don't talk about the religion per se. I mean, there are other people now who know a lot more about Chinese Islam as a religion, religious practices than I ever will know. Okay, I'm more interested to see how all of this does it work with the um, with the with the community. So it's a, it's about trade around the canal, and then because we're talking about a minority, then there's the issue of trust because you know there are trade posts all over, you know, all the way from Beijing to uh, to the south, at least to the Yangtze Delta, you know, where you know different communities are in communication with each other. Okay. That makes them different from the rest of the population in their locales, but also it makes them different than other Muslims who don't have this prestigious history of being being settled on 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 the canal. Okay. And there was another question, but I missed so it. There was how they, like how did the empire thought about? Yes. Muslims, yes. So in this context, I mean, the, this is interesting because the Western regions, the CU, becomes you know. A place of origin. It also becomes almost synonymous, in fact, quite synonymous with Islam it, itself in different in different moments. But at the same time, they are quite savvy in knowing how to use the the language of a bandit, non bandit situation. And they make they they want to make they want to show that they are able to make the difference, and they make the difference. That's the point. Okay, so I think we're we're coming to an end, but this really was a wonderful talk. It really illuminated, as a microhistorian, <laughs> I was really deeply appreciative of how brilliantly his, he uses this single individual um, to, I'm, I'm, putting, I'm tracing right, sort of his reputation, how he's remembered over time. So it, it, it is a case study, but it goes beyond that, right? It, 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 in how Wei Shu is being remembered or defined and situating it within the context of how people understand Muslims, or whether it's Shandong anxiety or not, or whether it's the situation of the local um, Shandong family, how they understand their Muslimness, right? And how hence Wei Shu remembered differently. And that is really what's so brilliant about Mongo history. Um, but to me, he's also doing it in such an ambitious way in terms of covering and just following, just following his mind, right? Following his he's some detective who is a wonderful philologist, who's also so imaginative. So um, all that really comes together nicely in this single case, uh, in a single in the single talk, and we're looking forward to the history of Islam over time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's all give him a round. Uh, <laughs>